It's at the letters for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024. Arden Zwelling here with Ben Nicholson Smith. Our producers are Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade. Thanks as always for listening. Uh, Ben, you are in Houston with the team right now. Uh, We've seen the first two games of uh, the Blue Jays series against the Astros this week. They won one, they lost the other. Uh, We probably don't need to add any other context to these particular two games, right? (laughs) Yeah, just a couple (laughs) run-of-the-mill games. You know, it's it's pretty wild because in spring training, I don't think I'm telling too many secrets here and saying that I basically don't care what happens in the game as far as the result. I mean, I care what what happens as far as individual players, but whether the Blue Jays win or lose, we had this conversation this spring where I think it was like midway through and we're like, I I don't know what the record is. And I think we looked at each other and was like, I I honestly don't know what their spring record is. Then you get to the regular season and the record starts to matter a lot and the results matter a lot. And all of a sudden, these dramatic games unfold here in Houston and you know you're dialed in in a way that's just like whoa this is this is a bit of a shock to the system but it was pretty entertaining baseball so far I couldn't tell you right now what the Blue Jays spring record was nor could I I have no no idea idea, right I and I know generally that um like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and George Springer like had strong springs but I couldn't tell you like what their OPS was or how many homers they had like None of the actual results have been committed to my memory. Right. I mean, and and player to player, of course, like you follow those storylines and, you know, Bowden Francis had a, had a great spring. I'm sure we'll get to him in a second here. The regular season, not so much. But, you know, you, you look at individual players and individual storylines. But, yeah, I have no idea how many games the Blue Jays won. It's just not the point of, of spring. But, yeah, it's it's honestly great to watch some regular season games and to be in a be in a major league park and follow the couple really good teams. I mean, Houston, that is a, that's a really good baseball team despite their record. They have, they have obviously some really talented players. So it's been competitive games and um, it's right into the fire for the Blue Jays as we knew it would be. I'll tell you one thing I do know, Ben, I do know that like maybe nine months ago, eight months ago, whatever the math is on that, you and I were in Detroit at Comerica Park right before the All-Star break. Classic Arden and Ben coverage series right before the All-Star <laughs> break, middle of summer weekend in Detroit. Uh, and what did we witness on the Saturday afternoon? We witnessed the Blue Jays get no hit by Matt Manning, Jason Foley, and Alex Lang. And then we saw them come back the next day, have a completely listless offensive performance through eight innings and two outs, at which point Danny Jansen ripped a two-run homer off of Lang in the top of the ninth to tie a game that the Blue Jays would eventually go on to win. Jansen with a fly ball that's hit to deep left field. It's a tie game! Old Benny history books out there in Houston, in Houston right now. History just repeating itself with another no-hitter followed by last-second desperation comeback with the two-run homer. What the hell is going on here, man? Why does this keep happening to you? Schneider. And Schneider hits one high and deep to left center. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it was uh, it definitely brought back memories of that sequence of events in Detroit. And it's kind of unusual to see the Blue Jays get no hit in back to back years. They've been no hit eight times in their history. I've been at four of those no hitters. Um, so seeing them get no hit a lot. Um, and yeah, this one was it was very reminiscent of what happened in Detroit last year because it was totally unexpected. I mean, it's not like they're going up against Jacob deGrom or Corbin Burns. Like you have Ronel Blanco, who is a 30 year old swing man who is only making his eighth major league start. And it's the last thing you're expecting, even as the game progressed into the middle innings. But you know, it, it, yeah, he had the game of his life, obviously. I mean, that's that's the best major league game he's ever going to pitch. And and credit to him, his changeup was amazing. But, you know, it's an interesting line, and we can get into it a little bit. Like, how much do you give him credit versus how much you kind of say, hey, the Jays hitters just aren't really producing the way they should be? 
well, how much do you give him credit versus how much are the Jays hitters not producing the way they should be? Because look, like the scouting report coming in certainly would have been, hey, this guy like has got a really good slider. He's going to play it off of his fastball. That's what you should expect. And then Blanco comes out and he's got this great changeup working arm side. And uh, look, now he's got three pitches that he's using against the Blue Jays. He's got a fastball and slider that he's tunneling, you know, fastball kind of in that um, kind of away from righties lane and the slider going off of it and he's got the change up glove side you would think that one trip through the order the blue jays would have said oh hey this guy's got a third pitch now he's got a change up now we need to be aware of that maybe we need to adjust our approach clearly if those adjustments were attempted they did not take because blanco ended up not giving up a hit and coming close to throwing a maddox so which side of that fence do you fall on credit blanco or damn the blue jays hitters Honestly, I give Blanco credit because if you were just to look at the pitches in a vacuum and you didn't know what happened as far as whether hitters swung or anything, you just looked at the individual pitches, then I still think you'd be pretty impressed with that changeup and with his you know ability to throw strikes and get ahead in counts. So you know maybe we change our tune if Emerson Hancock comes to Toronto and no hits the Blue Jays next week, or you know if Clark Schmidt throws eight shutty at the, in the Bronx this weekend. Like yeah, okay, at that point you've got a little bit of a pattern. But as things stand right now, I'm personally, and I want to hear your take on it, but. I'm personally kind of like sometimes dudes have amazing games and they're going to come against the Blue Jays sometimes. And that's not the end of the world. And I know that's not what people want to hear. Maybe it's a little easier to hear because they came back and won with the David Schneider uh, you know, bomb. They obviously have offensive issues still to work through. And I'm not saying that we just say that, hey, they're they're solved. Clearly, there's nothing to say that they've solved their offensive questions. But I'm okay to say that Blanco really pitched well and deserved that no-hitter, and and that's not an indictment necessarily of the entire Blue Jays' offensive operation. I think that he game-planned really well. I think that he had a really good idea going in of how to neutralize Blue Jays' hitters, and like clearly the results speak for themselves. And it's like it's one of two things that I was struck with coming off of that game, and they both get back to just like what a strong organization the Houston Astros are holistically. Um, they've had great game plans in this series, just in terms of how they're attacking Blue Jays hitters, how they're approaching them, how they are pitching them. They've had great game plans for their hitters against Blue Jays pitchers. You look at the way that they hunted those elevated fastballs against um, Bowden Francis in the opener and, and made him yeah. pay for the few that, that he left up. Like I think that just speaks to how well they scout, how well they prepare, how well they game plan. And then I think the fact that they have a guy like Ronel Blanco filling in in their rotation, not a guy who was supposed to even be on their opening day roster, but somebody who was really just an injury fill in in the number five spot in their rotation coming up and throwing a no hitter that speaks to the depth of talent in their organization. And that speaks to their development. And that speaks to what a good job they do of helping um, pretty unheralded athletes get the most out of themselves. Like you said, Blanco is a guy who has been like up and down swing man type, um, you know, wasn't like a big prospect coming out of the Dominican was one of these like very quiet signs by the Astros. And he's been in their organization for a, for a very long, long time they brought him along slowly and helped him get better and now here he is at the age of 30 probably still with his rookie eligibility throwing a no hitter for them like it was such a contrast to me in that game that the Blue Jays had Bowden Francis on the mound who is like this late 20s up and down swing man a guy who the club has been working to develop into a reliable starter you know mid 90s fastball pretty good breaking ball but doesn't really have that third pitch yet that can help him like um, persist as a starter versus Blanco, who again, 30, you know, late 20s, 30 year old up and down swing man in the last few years. His club's been working to help him develop a third pitch so he can be a reliable starter. Mid 90s fastball, good breaking ball. And now here he is with that third pitch. And that's why he was so much better than Francis in that game, because he had a third pitch to go to when the Astros were executing a great game plan against Francis. He didn't have a reliable third option off of his fastball and breaking ball to go to, to do something else, to throw something else in the zone, to get strikes in order to counter their game plan. So like, I think that is 
the difference in why Blanco threw a no hitter while Bowden Francis gave up three home runs and uh, seven earned over his start is just that the Houston Astros are, have just been a superior organization, not only recently, but like over the last decade at identifying talent, developing it, getting it better, and just the progressing it up to their big league club so that when they do have injuries, when they do need to look within to paper over absences in their rotation, they're getting Blanco performances rather than the one that we saw from Bowden Francis in the same game. Right. And and I want to get to, to Bowden Francis, but just on the Astros and, and their development, it's been so consistent, right? You look at Framber Valdez comes up in 2019, Christian Javier in 2020, Luis Garcia in 21. Last year, it's Hunter Brown. Now, I'm you know I'm not going to say that Ronel Blanco is like a long-term fixture for their rotation. We'll see what his future holds um, at the major league level, but they have been really consistent. And this is, again, without the benefit of drafting in the top 10 picks at this point in their in their franchise arc. So it's really impressive what they've done from a developmental standpoint. Internationally, they've been really successful at finding guys who are off the radar and developing them into meaningful big league contributors. So that's what you have to do as a, as a major league team. And, and you have to have these young guys come up and impact the rotation because, you know, you look at the Blue Jays last year, they were so consistent and so steady, but that was a veteran group. And they were the only team, the only major league team last year that didn't have any rookie starting pitcher appear in the big leagues. So that's not really something that you can do every single year is just rely on your veterans and your veterans alone. This year, they're going to need some young guys. So maybe it's Bowden Francis, maybe it's Ricky Tiedemann, but they need some of those less experienced pitchers to take those developmental strides and show that they're capable of making whatever adjustments are needed at the big league level. Yeah, this is why the Astros have been as successful as they've been over time. It's everything that you just said, and it is honestly just some of the game planning and scouting and advanced prep that they do and the buy-in from their players to the the strategies that they utilize. Like I think we saw it in game two of this series as well late. The Astros clearly had something on Alejandro Kirk late there. When you see Kyle Tucker going first to second, advancing a base on a foul pop-up behind the plate, because Kirk fell asleep with him at first. That's clearly something that the Astros had seen on tape and had gone into that game looking to exploit. You saw Altuve trying to exploit the same thing later on when he was actually picked off by Kirk at third base. You know, Jose Altuve in that spot was trying to come home because he expected Kirk to kind of be asleep in that moment and to just be flipping the ball back to the pitcher. You know, credit to Kirk for actually noticing that and getting yeah. Altuve at third. But I think those two events tell you that this is something that the Astros game plan for and something that they were looking to exploit. It's those little things like it's it's all of that coming together. It's the talent. It's the development. It's the game playing, the strategy, executing a plan, like all those things working in harmony. That's why a club like this has been as successful as it's been for as long as it's been. Yeah, I think Astros, Rays, Yankees, I mean, those are probably some of the teams that come to mind when it, when you think about really strong game planning, really strong um, prep that goes into what happens before and during a major league game. And it does connect to Bowden Francis because, as you mentioned, he got a little predictable with those two pitches. And the Astros, when he was throwing the high fastballs up in the zone, they knew it was coming. They knew that that was going to be a part of his game plan. And Francis acknowledged as much after the game. John Schneider realized clearly that that's what was happening too. And so you have uh, Tucker taking him deep on a high fastball. Diaz, by the way, incredible pickup by the Astros to get Yainer, Yainer Diaz for Miles Straw. Just an amazing trade by them a few years back. But Diaz takes him deep on a high fastball. So then... You know, he has the curveball, and the curveball was a great pitch. It's so slow, and they were really off balance. It was especially effective against Bregman, and the the curve was re really good. And the fastball, in my opinion, it wasn't bad, but as you said, Arden, he just doesn't have that third pitch. He tries to get a slider across. He hangs one middle-middle to Jeremy Pena. Pena hammers it. So how do you get around that predictability, right? Like you, you're only throwing essentially two pitches that you have full conviction in. The splitter clearly not a pitch that he has full, full conviction in or, or the ability to execute against these elite, elite hitters. Same with the slider. So you're kind of stuck in the middle a little bit. And this is the difference too of, the, of 
a challenge that you face as a starting pitcher. Compared to being a reliever, you have a little bit more element of surprise because they haven't spent 45 minutes looking at what you do before the game. Whereas as a starting pitcher, all right, who is this guy? What's he going to do? All right, we're prepared for him. And then a team like Houston can execute and make Francis look pretty overmatched, at least for one night. Yeah, I think there were some positives to take away from it. Like he threw a ton of strikes. He filled up the zone. Uh, he walked only one. Um, you know, even when things weren't going his way, he wasn't backing down. He wasn't getting skittish with with the strike zone. Like he was still yeah. trying to execute and he was still attacking hitters. Got a ton of swing and miss with the curveball. Like that's clearly an effective pitch. And, uh, you know, I think that his, his fastball is effective when hitters aren't just sitting on it. Uh, it's got a ton of ride because it's actually a pretty high spin fastball. So, I think that, you know, if he's executing a bit better, that um, it, it can be more effective than it was against Houston. I think the Astros just had like a really good approach against it. And I also think that Francis probably needs to locate that fastball down a bit more often into the edges a bit more often for strikes so that hitters yeah. can't just like sit on the high ones that they see. Um, and then clearly, obviously, he needs to avoid, like like you said, the meatball sliders right over the heart of the plate, which are just going to be a problem for any pitcher against a hitter uh, at this level. So I think there are things to build on. And I think they're, you know, Dowden Francis certainly deserves another start and probably another one after that. But like, I am curious to to hear yeah. if it has changed your perspective or opinion on just his grasp of the fifth starters role on this club going forward, particularly with Alec Manoa returning to form or, you know, continuing to build up with Yariel Rodriguez looking really strong in his debut with the triple A Buffalo Bisons. Like how did your perspective on Francis going forward change at all based on the the results of his first outing? I, I think you're always shifting things gradually right as new information comes in and the gradual shifts that occurred around francis were not positive i think that's safe to say but i i don't fundamentally view him all that differently after that one start i agree with you there were some positives the fact that he's able to go out there and just keep absorbing innings i love that he was able to keep filling up the strike zone i mean that's not easy to do Um, against the lineup that good he's making his first major league start on the road against the Astros he's just attacking them I mean you've got to like some of those things if you're the Jays and he got him swinging 95 up in the zone to take care of Alvarez or one thing you're not going to do is you're not going to intimidate Bowden Francis just because Altuve hit that first fastball Francis has confidence that he can get it by these good hitters obviously he starts against the Yankees this weekend after that I think he still gets at least a couple more starts to show what he can do. And then it just plays itself out at a certain point. Like if Alec Manoa, you know, he was slated to throw a sim game on Tuesday for three innings. So then from there, it's four, then it's five. So within a few weeks, as we record this on April 3rd, it's possible that by late April, he's a viable option. And if he's doing really well against hitters, Maybe there's a discussion to be had. For now, there's no discussion to be had. And same with Yariel Rodriguez, where that was a really positive start, but he's still just trying to get his footing. Um, You know, the velo, there's probably room to go up a little bit. He was sitting 92 um, velocity-wise. You might want to see that tick up just a little bit more if you're the Jays before you, you know, decide to, to make a shift in that rotation. So Bowden Francis clearly hasn't earned, you know, a full season's worth of starts, but I I think he gets three, four, something like that. And then you just reevaluate and you see if there's a better option. All right, you make that move. If there's not a better option, then I think there's enough positive there to let him face a batting order a couple times and, and go from there. Yeah, right now you don't have a better option. So Francis obviously right. remains in in the rotation. And I think that one way or another, Bowden Francis is a big league pitcher, whether that's in the Blue Jays rotation or in their bullpen. Because look, like the yeah. fastball curveball will play out of the bullpen. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think he still has to prove that he can carry his velocity deeper into an outing as a starter. And clearly he needs to have some sort of a third offering if he's going to last long term as a starter, if he wants to turn lineups over a couple of times. But like even if like this um, stage in the Blue Jays rotation doesn't end up working out, I think there's a role for him 
on the big league club in the bullpen. Where this is going to get interesting is, yeah, if you get a Manoa or Rodriguez being an option. And, you know, with Manoa, like, we'll see how things go in that sim game that's, uh, you know, that was pitched Tuesday night. Uh, We, you know, as we record this here on Wednesday morning, like, we don't know yet, you know, what the results there were. The reports we've heard from the Blue Jays was that, like, you know, his stuff has looked good as he's been building up and that the, I think importantly, the velocity was there. We're hearing that it's consistent in the mid 90s and like that's something specific you know teams can always say oh this guy looked great the stuff looked awesome and like what does that mean that doesn't really mean anything but when you're giving us an actual metric and saying the the velocities in the mid 90s well that's something that we can test as soon as this guy starts throwing in front of hawkeye or a track man or you know whatever it's something that we can look up on savant when he starts a rehab assignment so the fact that they're saying that I think is encouraging. I think the biggest thing for, for Manoa is he just has to get back into like a regular starters routine, has to be pitching every five days, obviously being built up, facing hitters. Um, you want to know that the action on the sinker is sound and the, like the, the spin on his breaking ball is back to previous levels. So we'll see with him. The thing with Rodriguez is that we've now seen it and there is now proof of concept of this. And um, I agree with you. You could you would like to see a bit more velo out of him, but it is really hard to argue with the results that he posted for Buffalo on Tuesday. Four innings, no hits, no runs. He walked one and struck out six. And while the fastball velo like wasn't where it can be for him, I think that his fastball played really, really well. In that outing, he had five whiffs with it, eight called strikes. You put those together, you've got a 46% called strike and whiff rate. And just for context on that, like 30% is good. And 40% is really, really good. Yeriel Rodriguez had 46% with his fastball in that outing. So that tells you that pitch was playing really well at the AAA level. Um, he threw 65% of them in, in the zone for strikes. The The majority of his pitches were on the plate. He was attacking. He allowed only one hard hit ball. I just think that he showed really well in that start. For his first start in North America at this level, like, you know, facing these hitters with everything that he's been through, with getting to this point, with not competing last year, like, I think he's probably even ahead of where the Blue Jays expected him to be at this point. And if he goes out again in his next start and repeats what he showed in Buffalo on Tuesday or for Buffalo on Tuesday... I don't know how much more you need to see if you're the Blue Jays to to get them to the big league level and start using some of this stuff in games that really matter. Yeah, well, and last week I was making the case that, hey, you might want this guy in the majors right now. And I think that, you know, on the merit of his stuff, we saw the other day, clearly he's he's a major league arm. And John Schneider acknowledges as much. Um, obviously, Ross Atkins in the front office believe that he's a major league arm or they wouldn't have spent $32 million on him. So, Everyone agrees. I think it's just a question of when that timing is and what that role looks like. And the more he pitches like that, the sooner he's going to be a real option for the majors. So that's going to be really interesting to see. And in the meantime, you know, life doesn't get a lot easier for Bowden Francis, right? Like you, you think about Houston and and their lineup on the road. Well, his second start is slated to be in the Bronx. And, you know, on Sunday morning when when Aaron Judge wakes up, he's going to be looking at some video probably of Bowden Francis and kind of realizing, all right, it's fastballs up, it's curveballs down. And they might, the Yankees, if they're doing their job, they'll probably pass along the quotes from Bowden Francis and John Schneider saying, hey, we need to have some fastballs down in the zone too. And Aaron Judge <laughs> looks at that and says, all right, fastballs up, maybe a couple of fastballs down and curveballs. And that's a really good hitter. And Juan Soto is doing the same thing and Glaber Torres. And it's like, yeah, that is the next test. That's not an easy one. But, you know, that's life in the American League East. You can't expect anything otherwise. Like, this is the challenge. You got to get those hitters out. And, you know, if if they can, then that'll be huge for the Jays. And if they can't, they're going to have to readjust and and find some different ways to get through those tough matchups. Just picturing Alex Verdugo reading a Ben Nicholson Smith article. As part of his preparation, uh, I, I would imagine, I would imagine that some some intern within the Yankees front office is tasked with finding, you know, the the notable quotes and you know consolidating them. Right? I, I hope that. I mean, well, I, I hope that Oxford Duke is reading my articles, but I highly, highly doubt it. 
we know the teams are doing this stuff. I think that it shows up in the way that Blue Jays hitters have been approached this first week through the season. I'm sure that they saw a lot of what Don Mattingly has been saying and a lot of what's been written about the Blue Jays offensive approach. And I think that's probably a pretty big reason why in that opening Rays series, those first four games, like every fastball to a right-handed hitter was up and away. Uh, yeah, we're not going to give you that pitch on the uh, inner half that you know you can handle and drive. We're going to stay away from you because we understand what you're approaches right now and so we're going to try to steal those strikes away from you uh if you're going to give them to us we could talk about the offense in the second half i think because like we need a lot of runway for that discussion but just to tie up the pitching and tie up the first half here is there anyone else in the starting staff that you have some thoughts on that you want to that you want to consider um you know we've seen jose barrios twice now we saw chris bass's debut outing obviously we saw the 70 pitches or however many it was for for Kevin Gosman and we've seen Yusei Kikuchi as well kind of struggling with his command in his first outing anyone you want to talk about there I got two guys to to touch on um Barrios and and Yenesis Cabrera um because you know with, with I did Barrios, not even mention Yenesis Cabrera <laughs> how could you we, are, how could we overlook you really want to talk about him all right go ahead <laughs> so with Barrios um He's made two starts. The first one, man, he he was electric. I thought I thought he looked so good. I know Yandy Diaz took him deep on a changeup just in off the plate. Great job by Yandy Diaz. Barrios' stuff was so lively. Had tons of velo, which is notable because, you know, this time of year, April, March, like that is the lowest month for velocity across Major League Baseball every single year as pitchers kind of deal with some cold weather, continue just building up out of spring training. So his velo was really high. Um Great sign for the Jays. Great start for Brios. And then in the second start, he didn't have quite as much life. He was, he was telling us after the game, just didn't feel like he had that same um, kind of electric, fastball electric stuff. But his slurve was really good. And he was just able to make it through against the Astros. So for me, to see Brios pitch the way he did those first couple starts, that's got to be tremendously encouraging for the Blue Jays. We know he's be, he's been a consistent pitcher for years this isn't anything new but I thought we're seeing him really in vintage form and that's got to be encouraging for the team yeah I I agree with you on Barrios I wouldn't even add anything there I think you summed it up really well Uh, before I let you get to your uh, Yenesis Cabrera diatribe let me just uh, touch on Kevin (laughs) Gosman because I think that what like he is doing I, I don't know if we're making a big enough deal about it the fact that this guy had one spring training outing in a game and through three innings in that outing, I guess he came out for a fourth, if I'm remembering correctly that day in Bradenton. But I mean, like faced hitters in a live game environment once in spring training and then comes out against the Rays in um, his opener to the 24 season and like just looks like himself. And obviously, I mean, like, you know, pitching, knowing that he's only going to throw about 70 pitches in this outing and like knowing that he's working with a very finite amount of time in this game, even more so than you would expect for a, a starter their first time out. And here he is like striking out six over four and a third, allows only two hits one of them a a homer obviously but I felt like he really just settled into being like elite ace like Kevin Gosman as that start went on we saw him 96 97 through the the third and fourth innings like his last pitch of that outing the one that he hit Jose Siri with was 98 it was the hardest pitch he threw all game. His last pitch of that outing like, is just so uncommon what he is doing with the weird spring that he had with the shoulder issue, with the truncated buildup, with just like the lack of being in a rhythm and having um, you know, the ideal conditions and scenario to get ready for a regular season. I just was so impressed and am so impressed with the way that he has shown up for this year. Like This is why he is a Cy Young candidate. This is why he is an ace because because even with the circumstances he's had to deal with this spring, he has just shown up and looked like himself right out of the gate. And he makes quick work of Siri. A good second inning, three up and three down for Gosman. Yeah, it's a huge, um, a huge difference maker for the Blue Jays. And like you say, this is why you need guys like Kevin Gosman on your staff. This is why you go out and get them in free agency. So that's a huge development for the Blue Jays, just that he's been able to take the mound and, and be effective. So, Genesis Cabrera. To me, look, I know it's only been two games, but I think these two games have been basically 
worst case scenario for how his season would start, right? Like his first game, he comes in, he allows a couple hits, he allows a run, he shoves Jose Caballero for no reason, like totally unnecessary and just, yeah, no reason to do that. And, you know, thankfully cooler heads prevail around him and it doesn't escalate further, but he's suspended by MLB for three games. Jays get him into the next game. Okay. Yeah. Let's use Yenis' Cabrera against a couple lefties. And yeah, that doesn't work out. He allows two home runs, uh, including one to a lefty. And it's just, yeah, like a really, really bad start to the season for him. And this is his specific role, right? Is to, to get lefties. And he has not done that. So yeah, I think to the extent that I don't want to overreact, but at the same time, like, I don't know. Like, this is very unimpressive start to the season. I'm just, like, mentally and as far as his performance, and I just, I don't really get it. It's not, I, I if I'm the Jays, I'd be really unimpressed with this. And, yeah, what do you think about Yanis Cabrera so far? So, yeah, I agree that, like, shoving Jose Caballero was just absolutely unnecessary. And he gets the three so games. So needless. And, oh, and some words, and now a shot. As the Blue Jays get out there quickly to wrap up Yenis' Cabrera and the dugouts in the bullpens have cleared. <laughs> yes, and it, it, it's hurt his team because now the Blue Jays are managing a reliever short for two games early in the season when their starters aren't fully stretched out and when they're trying to be really mindful of bullpen workloads and when they're on a 10 game road trip to start the year and like if anybody is familiar at all with jose caballero from his time with the mariners last year like this is a stuff disturber you know, like this is somebody who is trying to get under the opponent's skin and somebody who's going to be pesky and somebody who like you're going to hate playing against. Like that's just that is his reputation. That's what he did for the Mariners last year. So I'm not surprised that he is like, by the way, really heady play bunting on the oldest man in the league. But I'm not surprised yep. he's bunting in that scenario and he's trying for third and he's running into um, Yenesis Cabrera afterwards like he he's doing what he's on the field to do and you know since Cabrera reacted to it he shouldn't have he should have just walked away and just like let it be but he shoved him and it's his, not you know since Cabrera's first suspension like he's been suspended prior for throwing at a at a hitter when he was with the with the uh, with the Cardinals so that's probably why the initial suspension was three games um which you know seems lengthy for a shove but I'm sure that the uh, the prior history played into that um, and yeah, you're right. Like the results haven't been great so far. Obviously, it's the first week of uh, of the season. So none of us are really like taking results all too seriously or reading too much into them. And I think that if anything, the fact that um, the stuff plus on Yanis Cabrera's fastball has been well above average, 117, is a reason why the Blue Jays are going to keep giving them opportunities and you're going to just get them back into the flow, say, hey, just like, cool it don't shove anybody please like just go out there and pitch and execute like i don't think that his job is at risk here um because you know we know the blue jays care about models like these and care about the quality of stuff so the fact that cabrera is showing that i think is is a reason why he's going to get a lot more rope um so you know that's kind of where i stand like i agree with everything that you said but uh you know i think there is still a very useful pitcher here just has had uh you know a, a, a less than ideal start to his 2024 campaign yeah, when you're facing Alvarez and Tucker and you walk Alvarez and allow the homer to Tucker, I, yeah, it's, I mean, obviously he's capable of more than this. And so, like you say, there's probably room to be a little bit more patient um, until someone like maybe a Mason Fluharty becomes more of a viable option. We'll see. But it's, I, I would say I'm thoroughly unimpressed. But, you know, I would compare that to a guy like Tim Meza, who's never going to shove anybody on a field or off of it, really. He's just not that guy. Uh, but, we talked about this two weeks ago, three weeks ago, at some point at the end of spring, his Vila was down at the end of spring. He didn't look great in spring outings. He actually had a, a little stretch in spring where he wasn't pitching. And then he went and pitched in the minors. And it was just, you know, it was, it was a little strange what was going on there. And then we see him on Tuesday in Houston again. Yeah. Like facing tough lefties and uh, he's not throwing his fastball at all. He's only throwing sliders, and Tim Mays has been like a 90% sinker guy at times in his career. Now, 
the context of that is that he's facing Kyle Tucker with a five-man infield, so perhaps he's just throwing sliders down to try to get that ground ball, and maybe John Schneider told him before that plate appearance, hey, throw four sliders that their misprofile, their mispattern is going to be below the zone, and they're going to be balls. Hopefully he swings at it, hits a ground ball into this five-man alignment, and we get this out that we're looking for here. So maybe that's why he wasn't throwing his sinker. I don't know. All I know is that when we've seen his sinker recently, it hasn't looked like Tim Mesa's sinker from the last few years. And he has not looked yeah. like he's been in Tim Mesa form. And I will again like cite the stuff plus metric on Tim Mesa's sinker, 86 so far this season. Very small sample again, just like you know, the Genesis Cabrera 117 on his fastball. Very small sample. These are guys who've only thrown like two, three innings to this point. So these things can change, but I like I did a few weeks ago. I, I just have an eye on what's going on with Tim Mesa here because his stuff has not looked uh like where it needs to be for him to be effective. Yeah, I think it's fair to have questions around both the lefty relievers and Mesa definitely is a, is someone to watch on that front for sure. I guess the difference being Yanisus Cabrera has allowed two more home runs and been suspended for two more games, and so <laughs> you know you kind of look at you know of the two lefties, I know who I'm more concerned about at this point. But hey, it's not like Mesa's totally allayed all of the concerns that you might have around him. Yeah, some some serious questions when it comes to uh, lefty relievers for the Blue Jays. That's the pitching, uh, and we have to talk about the offense with this team because it was a topic in all of 23, and it's probably going to be a topic in all of 24. So we'll dive into that when we continue on At The Letters. Listen to At The Letters ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. It continues on at the letters, Arden Zwelling, Ben Nicholson, Smith. Our producers are Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade. And uh, Ben, the Blue Jays have played uh, six games so far this season, but man, does it feel like 60. Each one has been its own little uh, Shakespearean play. And if you are just somebody who has been like just tuning in at random to this Blue Jays season over the last week, like you are liable to have seen them um, firing on all cylinders offensively as they were uh, in the season opener and as they were in the final game of that Rays series at the Trop. Deep center. He certainly got enough of this one, didn't he? An absolute bomb to straightaway center. Vladdy's first of the season. That's You're also liable to have seen them looking pretty hopeless offensively and looking pretty 2023-ish offensively as they did in sort of the middle two games there against Tampa as they have in both games against Houston. Honestly, you're liable to have seen this team get no hit. You're liable to have seen this team hit a two-out, two-run homer to win a game in the ninth inning off one of the best closers of the last several years so like as you've been riding this roller coaster ben the the peaks the valleys like what 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 is real here like what can you take away from these like disparate poles of these first six games that can tell us something about the blue jays offense going forward Whew. yeah i wow yeah what is real I, i'd say we can we can definitively say that the blue jays have cost themselves chances to win games when they haven't hit offensively you know is that a predictive thing does that mean that they're doomed this year I don't think so so far their offense hasn't been good right like 22 runs in six games that would be 3.6 runs per game that would be akin to where the Oakland A's were last year the very very worst offense in baseball so it's been bad like uh, despite a few flashes of, of brilliance they have been pretty inept offensively to start this season but it, it's six games and they face some good pitching and I hesitate to read into this too much they have a mostly healthy team um Justin Turner you know the the one guy who's 39 years old and you might be worried about him falling off a cliff like he's actually been really productive so you know clearly you know Bo um, is is going to do more than this. And Kiermaier and Vladdy and even Springer, despite the two homers, and Kirk is obviously going to do more. They're not this bad. Um, they they have been bad. It, they probably could be 4-2 and two or 5-1 and one if they'd been a little bit better. But, 
you're not going to have it clicking at, at, at all times. I guess my answer is a little rambly to that because I just I don't know that there's much that you really can read into this. I mean, unless you want to just go off on doomsday takes and like try <laughs> to get retweets, which like, you know, hey, go for it, I guess, if you want to do that and play that game and say like they're doomed and they're never going to hit again. And, you know, this is just a continuation of last year and let's all turn off our TVs. But that's just not where I'm at. Yeah, that market is uh, oversaturated. If anything, yeah. um, <laughs> you're not going to dive in. You're not going to. You're uh, not going to try to compete in that market. I mean, like, so through six games, like the results, it's different than spring training in that the results count and they matter, and they will make up like the results that I will start paying some attention to. Come, I don't know, May, June, uh, you know, at least 100, 150 plate appearances from now. But I'm not like I really don't care what anybody's batting average is right now. I don't care who has however many home runs. I don't really like care who has however many extra base hits. Like the the only things that I'm really like keeping an eye on right now, I'd say, are the ways that hitters are being attacked um, and some of the approaches that we're seeing. From hitters. So what do I mean by that? Like when it comes to approach, like I am definitely uh, keeping an eye on the fact that George Springer is not chasing at all. Like this is a guy who has been very selective and patient at the plate this year. And I think that's a really good indicator. Like he had, he went a while there where he hadn't chased at all. Just look at it right now. His chase rate is 7.7%. I mean, that is minuscule. And down there towards the bottom with him is Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who also is not yeah. chasing much at all and is, and is taking his walks and is not expanding and trying to do too much. To me, those are very positive indicators going forward. Now, on the other side of that, Ernie Clement has chased over half the pitches that he's seen outside the zone. That's something that's going to need to come down. He's got incredible contact ability. It's a bit of like the gift and the curse with him, right? Is that like he can make contact with anything, but then he does make contact with anything and you just can't reliably drive pitches outside the zone for hits, for extra bases, for the kind of damage that you need to be doing to hang around at the big league levels. So I think that Ernie needs to be more selective and it's something he's talked about. And it's something that he worked on this spring and, and I know it's a, a plan that he's trying to take to the plate to this point um in the season he's he's chasing a lot and then you know the the other side of it the way the hitters are being attacked you mentioned the good results that justin turner has had to this point justin turner and now turner straightens it out and hits it a ton to left and that is gone his first home run is a blue jay his fourth rbi and like that's great if you're the blue jays because he's hitting cleanup for you most days some days he's hitting third so this is a very important hitter for you but justin turner has been attacked with a ton of fastballs to this point he's seen more fastballs than any player on the blue jays 42.4 percent that's interesting to me he's seen a lot of fastballs and clearly he's taking advantage of them does yeah. that approach change? Like, do pitchers start approaching him differently? Are they attacking him with fastballs a lot right now? Because last year, Justin Turner didn't hit very well against fastballs. Has he corrected something? Like, is he able to barrel fastballs better this year than he was last year? Or is the league going to keep pumping fastballs at him? And, and maybe as the season goes on and um, fatigue builds up and maybe the, the bat speed lessens a little bit, Maybe do those results change? So th these are some of the things that I keep an eye on right now, rather than who's hitting 500 or 100. Yeah, I think that's a really reasonable way to look at it because, you know, stuff like how players are being attacked, I mean, that reflects something real. Like with Justin Turner, the league knows he's old and they're going to try to force him to show that he is the bat speed to, to catch up with fastballs. And then there will be adjustments from there and they'll throw more breaking balls and see if he chases or whatever the case. And, and with chase rate too, that's a stat that will normalize pretty quickly. So, you know, same with velocity for pitchers. If we're talking about what matters early in the season, someone has more velocity, less velocity, that's a significant thing because it's statistically meaningful in a relatively small sample. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many players on this team who have underperformed, but I almost even hesitate to say it's like an underperformance because it's six games. You know, it's so, so early. It's like if a hitter goes 0 for 4, is he slumping or is it just, <laughs> it's like a game, right? Like it's, we're so, so early. So this is where 
And I look, I totally understand if you're a fan watching this and you know, you go through last year and the the offensive ineptitude in the in the regular season and then of course in the playoffs where they did not score enough, then you see them struggle offensively, which they have struggled offensively. They've been no hit. Then of course it's gonna be frustrating. Not taking that away from anyone, but I don't think it necessarily means like they're they're bad doesn't mean they're good. There's, I'm certainly not seeing indications to say this is a transformed offense and we should believe that everything is solved. I'm just kind of like in neutral right now, waiting to see which direction it goes. Yeah, at the end of April last season, I remember we're on April 3rd right now. So let's flash forward to like April 30th. I'm still not going to be like too invested or reading too much into who's had a good month and a bad month. I will say, yeah, so and so had a very strong April. Here is their WRC plus that is like well above 100. And so and so has not had a good enough April. Here is their strike strikeout rate that is like well above 30%. But that really isn't going to tell us anything about what the entire of their season is going to look like even at the end of this month which has just begun because remember at the end of april last year brandon belt had a 48 wrc plus and it was like counting down the days to his dfa and what are the blue jays gonna do well he ended up being like one of the blue jays best hitters last year by wrc plus the end of april last year matt chapman wasn't only the best hitter on the blue jays he was the best hitter in baseball literally 216 yep. weighted runs created plus in April. American League Player of the Month would have been the MLB Player of the Month because no one was even close to his WRC plus uh, in in April. We all saw what happened over the ensuing five months. And you even just take a look at the MLB leaderboard. Like These aren't just cherry-picked examples. At the end of April last year it wasn't just matt chapman towards like the top of of uh you know the the offensive leaderboards across mlb it was james outman and brandon marsh and thyro estrada and jonah heim you just look at some of the names on here jared kalanick <laughs> like some of these players who just did not end up having particularly impressive seasons these are guys who are like top 10 top 15 offensive players among qualified hitters in April last year. So, uh, you know, even three to four weeks from now, you still just have to be very careful with like what players have done and using that to predict what they will do going forward. You could absolutely use it to say this guy had a good April or a bad April, but it doesn't really tell us a whole lot about what the totality of the 2024 is going to look like. And I think that applies to the Blue Jays offense as well, which clearly we've seen it look very good over the last week. We've seen it looked pretty poor over the last week. I have trouble reading into any of those results and saying that this is what it's going to be throughout 2024. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. They have 156 chances left uh, as a team. 156 games, that's just so much more baseball ahead of us. And, you know, to say you would have to be really, really good at analyzing hitting to look at these six games and definitively know what's going to happen in the next 156. Like, I, I no GM in baseball would look at these six and say, all right, well, I've seen those six. Now I know what's going to happen. Like, literally none of them, none of them would 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 do that because you can't. No one in baseball can do that. And uh, that's, that's why it's fun. You don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, there's, there is... There's no way to know. Um, it's just it's just way too early. And, you know, so the best thing you can hope for is to have a little bit of momentum, which they do, thanks to David Schneider's home run uh, late Tuesday night, to have health, which, you know, they sort of do. But Bo Bichette told me yesterday that he was having trouble turning his neck to see the pitcher. So that's a little bit concerning, at least. He did get back into the lineup and um, was able to play and looked reasonably comfortable doing so. But, you know, if your shortstop can't turn his neck to see the pitcher, that's never an ideal thing. But largely, it seems like they are healthy. So you're, you're always going to deal with some level of, of injury during the season. And, and you got to kind of roll with that. We talk about how thin the margins are a lot on this podcast. Do you think about like how thin the margins were um, in the game on Tuesday night, where the Blue Jays are out to are down to literally their last out, and it's Davis Schneider against like one of the best closers that we've seen in years, and Josh Hader like hangs a slider to him, and Schneider executes a perfect swing on it, and just with that one swing, completely reverses what the narrative would be today. Yeah, like if. 
if Josh Hader does to Davis Snyder what he's done to thousands of hitters, like honestly one of the most elite closers of his generation, it it's a totally different discussion here on Wednesday morning than it is after Schneider hits that home run on on a hung slider from from Hader. Absolutely. I mean, you probably get these texts. I get I I'll get texts from from fans, messages from fans basically voicing their frustration uh with the team and with the offense. And and again, I get it. Like it's been it's been 8 years since they won a playoff game. It would be weird if fans weren't frustrated. And you know, that the off season was was disappointing. Um, you know, so then you go into the season, they get no hit. Like, yeah, of course it's not going to be a fun time. But David Schneider really reversed the narrative, uh, but it was just one swing. It doesn't change the fact that there are a lot of hitters on this team that still need to get going, and they do have some questions offensively. I still think that those questions have not been answered. They, I, I can't sit here and say the Blue Jays are fine offensively. I, I don't know that they are fine offensively, but I also don't know that they're doomed. So I that's where I just think that neutral is kind of the right gear to stay in right now. The fact that Davis Schneider has two home runs in his very limited playing time to this point this season, does that tell you that he deserves more run and he should be like an everyday player the rest of the way? Or does that tell you that the Blue Jays have actually put him in really optimal matchups and used him really intelligently and they should continue using him that way going forward because clearly that's helping get the best out of him? It's always it's always in relation to what else is happening on the team, I think. And, you know, so you kind of look at Schneider in relation to Ernie Clement, in relation to Varsho and Kiermaier, um, Isaiah kind of Falefa as well. And you kind of fit the pieces together there along with the matchups that you're playing. I don't think that there's any reason, and I suspect you probably agree with me here, but I don't think there's any reason to go out and make these declarative statements where it's like he has to play every day because, all right, well, what if, if you're facing a bunch of lefties and, um, you know, this this makes sense. You want to get Varsha or Kiermaier on the bench. Perfect. You put him in there just like they did yesterday. That's a great way to get him into the lineup. You certainly don't want him, you know, sitting on the bench and never playing. But I just don't think you need to make these these big sweeping claims of like he has to be in there six days a week. You just kind of go matchup by matchup, and you know that can allow you to to put together a good lineup on a inning to inning basis. I know that's how the Blue Jays look at that, and I would suspect that they actually know what their defensive lineup and batting order is going to look like through the end of this current road trip. Like I think they yeah. have that all mapped out, and like you said, you know, Bobichet waking up with a stiff neck can change that a little bit. But I think that like. David Schneider's playing time is actually already decided for the next week. I think that's already pretty much set in stone. It would take, I don't think there's anything that really he can do or Ernie Clement can do or Isaiah Kiner Falefa can do to change their playing time meaningfully over the next several weeks. Like, I think that the Blue Jays have that rotation set up based on their matchups and based on the optimal defense behind whoever's pitching for them that day. Like, I think they have that already charted out. So I think you are, I don't think anybody's going to become an everyday player anytime soon. I think you are going to continue to see this rotation that the Blue Jays are running between IKF, Biggio, Schneider, Clement at second base, third base, and occasionally when you're facing a lefty, left field. I think it's like a draft, right? Like, it, you know, to put it in sort of writing terminology, I, I think they have an idea. And, and my guess is it's like three, three days, three, four days ahead of time. And they have a draft and then they adjust it and they edit it and they make it better, you know, in their eyes. Well, you know, the results will tell us if it's ultimately good or not, but they try to make it better. They try to improve it as they get more information each each day and they, they learn about health and, you know, someone gets suspended or someone's, you know, needs to go on bereavement or paternity list or all these different things. So I think they have a draft for a few days ahead of time. I, I don't think it's like locked in weeks uh, in advance, but I think they have an idea and they adjust as as things unfold. And, and the hope is that those adjustments can lead to a lot better results than what they've seen so far. And I think that the idea is if you put hitters into these situations that play best to their skills and to their approaches, 
they're likely to have better seasons overall. And I don't know that any of those four guys, Biggio, Kiner, Falefa, uh, Clement, and Schneider, are going to reach even 500 plate appearances this year. I think they all could end up in that like 400 to 450 range because like their playing time is going to be matchup based and it's going to be based off of the Blue Jays putting them in optimal situations to succeed. Um, I think that when you lack an ev- like a true everyday player at a position, like when you lack a Matt Chapman playing every day at third base or a Jose Altuve who's going to play every day at second base, that that is just the best approach. Like that is the best way to run this rotation. And ultimately someone will get hurt or somebody will perform so poorly that it changes things. Um, and maybe it'll look different, but I just think for, for the foreseeable future, what we've seen so far with, with this rotation at second and third and occasionally corner outfield is just what you're going to continue to see going forward. I don't think we're going to be calling any of that group an everyday player at any point. Now, something that was interesting to me and I'd like to get your take on was the fact that when Bo Bichette came out of the lineup with the neck issue, it was actually Ernie Clement who filled in at short rather than Isaiah Kiner Falefa. And then when um, you had both Kiner Falefa and Clement in the lineup at the same time, you had Clement at third and Kiner Falefa at second. Do you think we can read anything in to the fact that the Blue Jays, at least on those two days, preferred Clement at short over Kiner Falefa, preferred Clement at third over Kiner Falefa? Yeah, I, I think there is. And I asked John Schneider about this yesterday, and he said, oh, you know, it's variable day to day. Fair enough. That's what he said. Um, you know, it depends on a bunch of different things. Okay. Um, my personal uh, read on this, however, is that they just think Clement's a better defender than IKF. Um, and that's what their actions are telling us. And uh, of course, if you're John Schneider, probably don't want to be quoted as saying that, right? It's like, yeah, you know, we, we think Ernie Clement's better than the guy we just signed for two years and 15 million. Um, you know, there's no need. That's a needless thing for a manager to say publicly. But I think their actions do tell us that they like Clement's defense more than I can. I mean, what's your read? Do you think that's a fair read? That's kind of how I'm seeing it right now. I think that's a fair read. It's just a bit of a head scratcher for me, honestly. Yeah. It's not what I would have guessed. But then again, the, uh, like watching IKF's arm, I wouldn't say I'm overwhelmed with uh, watching his arm. I just I think that a lot of the value that the Blue Jays believed, or at least that I believe the Blue Jays believed Kiner Flaffode would bring was defensively, particularly as a third baseman. Like that was a real head scratcher for me. Like it's short, like fine, maybe I, I could I could see, you know, preferring Ernie there and, and having Kiner Falefa at third on that day. Like that makes sense. But the the day where it was like Kiner Falefa at second and Clement at third. Like I said, Kiner Falefa won a gold glove on merit at third base. This wasn't like one yeah. of those fluky gold gloves. Like, look up the defensive metrics. They were all super strong on him at third base. If we're six games into the season and you're already admitting, essentially, that Kiner Falefa isn't your preferred option at third base defensively, yeah, that one stuck out to me, Ben. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I think... Because IKF kind of becomes a lightning rod because he was the position player on whom the Blue Jays spent the most money in a pretty underwhelming offseason. So, you know, I, I get that. At the same time, clearly relative to other utility players, they overpaid um, in that market for Isaiah kiner falefa End of the day, though, to me, when I look at that deal still, we're talking middle reliever money. Like, it, I, I know $15 million is a ton of money for, for any normal human being, but it's... In the scope of Major League Baseball, it's middle relief money. It's like number six starter money. It's not. It's a bench player. The, to me, the issue is the Blue Jays didn't go out and do more and add a bigger position player to to round out their offense. It's not that IKF is you know this a problematic player to have around. He's a Major League Baseball player. He belongs on a Major League team. It's just a question of how he's deployed and how significant he is to your team. Yeah, he's making like three million less than Chad Green, so. Yeah. Just put that in that in perspective. Speaking of pitchers, then let me throw one more weird little uh element that stuck out to me when it yeah. was the fifth game of the season and it came time for the Blue Jays to put a position player on the mound five games into the year. Did you read anything into the fact that it was Kiner Falefa being the guy called upon to pitch, considering that as you said, he was their biggest splash position player wise as a free agent? 
over an Ernie Clement or a Davis Schneider, two guys who, you know, internally from the, the Blue Jays system had to earn spots on this team in the spring training. I I didn't read anything into it simply because IKF pitched four innings last year for the Yankees. So a little bit of an innings eater for the Yankees last year. Four innings, ERA of two two five. It's kind of funny in that game too. He was like objectively the Blue Jays' best pitcher um, with a scoreless inning. Um, so no, I didn't read anything into that just because yeah he'd done it before and you know now he's probably going to do it again because he was pretty effective. So the next time the Blue Jays are in a blowout, probably see IKF on the mound. Yeah, I guess it was more so a uh, this guy has more ability as a pitcher rather than who's our most expendable guy that we could put on the mound. Yeah, an experience too, just because it's a weird role to put a guy in. And I think with IKF having done it before, it's like you know he's he's been able to do it i don't think it's more i don't think it's a question of like oh ernie clement is so valuable that we can't put him on the mound i think it's more at least my read was ikf's done it so he's probably less likely to try to go out there and impress someone like he's he's just gonna lob it in there he's probably not gonna get hurt so we can at least allow him to do that there was a game in miami last year that i covered though when ernie clement did pitch i feel like it didn't go well i feel like he actually gave up a bunch of hits but he has done it as well in the okay. past. So yeah, it, that was well, what I, that was another one that kind of stuck out to me. It's kind of similar to the defensive positioning, where I was just kind of like, hmm. It was a, it was a one eyebrow raised move. I thought. Yeah, yeah. The, to me, the defensive positioning definitely got my eyebrows raised, and the pitching was more uh, okay. Here we go. But I didn't read <laughs> anything. I didn't read anything into it except for oh my goodness, what an awful game for the Blue Jays. All right, you're 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 there in Houston. You got one more game to cover before we step away and I let you get to work. Any any final thoughts, any last things you, you want to share about the Blue Jays from your time with them there in the great state of Texas? One tiny thing. It's just one of those weird behind-the-scenes things. I don't know when the last time uh, you were here if they had the same artwork on the walls in Houston in the visiting clubhouse, but they have this artwork of like various players. I just find it so funny because like amongst they have like I think there's like a Kobe Bryant one. There's one of the Giants winning the World Series. There's one of the Red Sox winning the World Series. It's like kind of cool art. It's just on the on the walls of the clubhouse. And then among those pictures, they have this painting of Vlad Jr. And um, I'm just thinking like how weird would it be if like to go on a business trip to another city and you're in this like you're you're at your work trip and then there's just art of you on the walls you know like what a what a bizarre life these guys lead and and for vlad jr i'm sure it's more normal um than it would be for for others because he's been kind of you know a celebrity so to speak his entire life but he just shows up and there's a painting of him on the walls in the visiting clubhouse like what a life I mean, when he goes to Rogers Center, there's like banners of his face all over the place. Right. So I'd assume he's, he's kind of used that to much, it. And that much, right. Yeah. And that's like part of the, the major league life. But then, you know, as, at your home stadium, but he even goes on the road and there it is just like sitting there. This giant painting of him. I, I don't know. I, I uh, it's just that's that's my final observation for the pod. Was there a Brian Servan painting? <laughs> no, that would have been if there was a Brian Servan painting, I would have led with that. I would have just said, we got to talk. We, gotta, we can't talk about the offense. We got to talk about the fact that there's a well, someone decided to paint, paint Brian Servan. Vogelback painting, perhaps that Mitch White. That also would have been noteworthy. Yes. So far, I have yet to spot one. Maybe someone will do a Genesis Cabrera one of uh, him and Caballero mid shove. <laughs> the two hands right to the jaw. Yeah. That could be a uh, nice that, little Renaissance style painting. The the double shove to the jaw, like the two hander to the jaw and then walk away. I mean, that is a move. I got to say that. It's That is a move. It's a move. It's a move. It uh, Ben's. Uh, in Houston and has to go work. So we're going to let him go. And uh, we've gone on too long about the Blue Jays, but uh, we can only hope and expect that they will give us just as much to talk about over the next six to seven games as they did over the first six that have been an absolute roller coaster. Hey, you want entertainment from your entertainment product? Like you want drama, like you want action, you want ups, you want downs, you want something interesting to watch every night. You want to not know what's coming. Well, the Toronto Blue Jays have delivered on that through six games of the 2024 season. Uh, We'll see how the final 156 
play out. Uh, he's Ben Nicholson Smith. I'm Arden Zwelling. Our producers are Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade. You are our listeners, and we thank you as always for listening. We'll talk to you next week on At the Letters. <laughs>